capacity in which you appear today. Well, good morning. My name is Bill McLennan. I'm uh, appearing as a private citizen. Thank you, and uh, thank you for appearing before the committee today. I invite you to make a brief opening statement, should you wish to do so, and then the committee will ask some questions. Thank you, you very much. Do you wish to make an opening statement? Sorry? Do you wish to make an opening statement? Oh, five minutes, yep. yep. Well, if you could keep it brief so that we maximise the opportunity for people to ask questions. Right, thanks very much. It's a bit like coming back to work, I have to admit, but anyway. Um, I submitted a CV to, uh, which I understand has been circulated to all uh, senators, but I've, I've had 40 years in, um, in statistics and uh, I've worked overseas as well. My first point I'd like to suggest is that the, uh, the contemporary advice that I've put forward from the Parliamentary Council at the time the Census and Statistics Act was being drafted leaves me strongly the opinion that the the Census Statistics Act doesn't provide the statistician with the power to direct people to provide their name in a census. I know there are other views around and, and I also realise that the only way to ever settle this is have a, a legal act, a legal process, and I'm not proposing that. However, given that the, uh, the revised act is not the statisticians, it, it actually belongs to the Parliamentary Council, I'd be surprised if his view didn't hold in any law case. As a matter of common sense, uh, there are two separate exercises we're looking at here today. One is the taking of the census, and the other is the matching processes afterwards. They are separate issues and not, should not be considered as one. In terms of taking the census, you don't need to have any, any compulsory collection of name. Um, They've always been collect collected in the past uh, you know, on a voluntary basis and with high cooperation from the public. The criterion here to collect uh, compulsory is really to have a large number of names in which the matching process can be undertaken. And it's pretty obvious that doesn't, is not covered by the Census and Statistics Act. Second, uh, I have grave doubts that uh, what the ABS wants to do with matching is actually covered, covered by its current legislation. Uh, that, that what they're trying to do is to become the role of data integrator of various government statistical administrative records. I'm not even sure that that function is compatible with the statistical function. They, they conflict slightly. And therefore, I'm not too sure of uh, the legal situation of the matching that's been done to date. Further and more importantly, I don't think the general public has any real idea of what the ABS plans are for data matching, and that the ABS has no idea what the impact of such a change would have on the vital cooperation the ABS needs from the community if it is to continue to do its job effectively. If the people don't want to answer questions they don't, Will they answer them incorrectly? Will they do something that's not helpful? So you've got to have cooperation. It also means the matching processes, uh, and I think this is pretty evident from the uh, internet uh, chatter, that the matching processes will certainly, almost certainly mean that the secret provisions of the Census and Statistics Act uh, will be breached. Further, there were many of these submissions that I got here in this folder, of people talking about the need for a social contract between the ABS and the community with respect to the census. How the social contract was perceived to exist, how that social contract was perceived to exist was broken by the decision to compulsorily, compulsorily retain names in the 2016 census to undertake data matching without properly engaging in engage in the community in the decision. I'd ask the committee to recommend that the ABS undertakes a comprehensive privity impact assessment of its data matching plans, and I mean a comprehensive independent assessment, and not the uh, process that went through in the late 2015. 
before it proceeds with any data matching, whether using the 2016 census data or data from its many household surveys. I'd also recommend the ABS be required to report all data matching it undertakes in its annual report in some significant detail, so the Parliament and the public can review and understand what is going on. Third, uh, many of the problems the ABS, I think, got into in running the 2016 census, and I could add many of the problems it run into in, in other major statistical series, such as the now obviously broken monthly labour force survey, is because it's walked away from the approach which in my day was called total survey design. Given the recent monthly labour force survey kerfuffle, it is provident actually that I provide a brief description of what this means in the paper I submitted to the committee. Entitled is the monthly labour force survey broken. In brief, the uh, total survey design is aimed at uh, making sure there are no surprises when the changes are implemented. Fourth, and lastly, if the committee is tempted to consider that the census be undertaken less frequently, for example, in order to save money, I would like here and now with what follows to scuttle that idea. I would suggest they look carefully at the advice of the Chief Law Officers to a High Court decision, uh, McKinley versus the Commonwealth in 1975, which led to the requirement for five yearly censuses in the current statistics legislation. The High Court decision was, that, quote, that the Constitution required that the population of the various states be ascertained during the life of each ordinary parliament for the purposes of determining the number of members in each state in the House of Representatives. Of course, the requirement to conduct a population count in all states every three years, besides being very costly, so half the cost of running a census, it would have almost been impossible time-wise to implement. There wasn't really any practical solution to the High Court decision. I, to, I yeah, in, a, in a fit of uh, bravery, suggested to the powers to be that perhaps I should tell the High Court that the decision couldn't be implemented, but uh, I didn't get much success with that suggestion. A compromise was reached, though, when the Attorney-General and the Solicitor-General said, and I quote, it necessarily follows that states' res respective populations be reliably determined. For this, some method of counting the population as such as a pre periodical, sense, periodical census is essential. The Law Office opinion led to the provisions of the Census and Stats Act, which require five yearly censuses and quarterly population estimates. Unlike what some people say, think, it's not for the purposes of collecting the census, it's collecting the right numbers to determine the uh, number of uh, seats in the House of Representatives. On the question of accuracy of population estimates in the context of the quinquennial censuses, the Law Officer said the temporal disparity between quinquennial census and triennial elections means that the statistical population estimates, which are based on the antecedent census, tend to become unreliable and thus to afford grounds for a court to hold that the number of of each state's members and the representatives is not in fact in proportion to its population. That's never happened. The accuracy of the state population estimates rely on measure on the accuracy of the census counts. It does make me wonder why it was suggested recently that the, pop that the frequency of the population censuses might be altered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McLennan. Now I understand that Senator Xenophon has joined us uh, on the uh, telephone. That's correct, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll, look, I just have a couple of questions, Mr McLean, and then I might hand it straight over to Senator Xenophon. Uh, firstly, have you had an opportunity to look at the ABS submission to this inquiry? Sorry, I missed that. Have you had a chance to have a look at the ABS submission to this inquiry? Well, it's very long and I, I did read it. Um, OK. Um, the ABS submission states that the uh, they have been uh, compulsorily acquiring names uh, since 1910, I think, as part of the, the census. Are you familiar with that, or do you dispute that? And they say that they have well, it. Well, I, I personally think that that is wrong. Mm -hmm. And 
I have uh, checked with a colleague who knows more about censuses than I do, and uh, in our knowledge, it's always been collected uh, on a voluntary basis. Okay. And also, they say that they've sought advice from the Australian uh, Solicitor General on this on this issue, and uh, they that uh, advice has confirmed that they've been acting within the law in relation to the census. Do you? Well, have I think they talk with the Australian government solicitors. Assist, what do they call them? Uh, The Solicitor General? No, what are the, uh, the, the, the people if you go to, if you want an opinion about, 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 about a legal matter? Um, Australian Government Solicitor, mm -hmm. AGS. And uh, AGS has an opinion, and these days the AGS opinion is just like an opinion from any other lawyer. Back in the days when I was uh, running, were running most of this, we only could only go to the Australian Government Solicitor and his opinion we had to follow. But that would change uh, many years ago when uh, you know, became, uh, giving that advice became privatised effectively. Mm. And it's just an advice. You, you pay the government solicitor for the advice just like you'd pay somebody else for the advice. Okay. And the advices have got to be uh, considered uh, on, their, uh, on their merit, not because they came from the Australian government solicitor. Okay. And my final question, Mr McLennan, is, uh, in relation to your experience as a former ABS, uh, a senior ABS uh, officer, um, do you would you care to reflect on to what extent the the operation of the ABS at the present time is affected by funding cuts? Do you, do you see that as impacting on the the quality of the work that the ABS is is doing? Well, that's a difficult one. Um, having not been in the in the uh, you know in the in the, in the um, hot seat for you know, a number of years. There's no doubt that there's been uh, significant cuts uh, happened to the ABS, uh, but uh, my perspective on it, well, that's the job as the managers in the ABS, uh, headed by the statistician and his senior staff, to work out uh, which, which projects are the, you know, the most important and if necessary to discuss with government, etc., and uh, make sure that whatever money they've got the most important ones get done and the least important ones drop off or you might may not do particular large collections you might cut them down to size and save money however if you keep cutting uh, you've got to think that there's going to be some impact somewhere and there's a lot of evidence this in the press um, the lady from the uh, Australian Financial Review uh, uh, made some comments on this matter not so long back. It's going to have some impact. Um, from where I sit and looking at it from the side, I often wonder why they're making certain decisions that they do make, and, and, and I think a lot of that's to do with lack of experience, if you really want to know. Okay. They're not lacking numbers, or well, they are maybe lacking numbers too, but they are lacking numbers of people with experience. Sure. There's been a gross loss of experience out of the ABS. And I think from what reading, that's happened right across the public service, not just the ABS, in terms of loss of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr Clennon. I might ask uh, Senator Xenophon if he has any questions. Yes, I do. Thank you very much, Chair. Can I just apologise to the committee? I, I'm not physically there today because I have a funeral to attend to later on, but I'll be back on uh, this afternoon with the committee. Um, Mr McLennan, thank you very much for your submission and for giving evidence. I have some questions that go to the ABS's power to collect names and addresses. You have argued in your, uh, in your submission that the ABS does not have the legal authority to collect names and addresses because, as I understand it, you don't consider it to be statistical information as such. Is that, in essence, what you're saying? Well, what it says in the Act, it says that if you, if you collect the information, you've then got to compile statistics and publish them. The Bureau is about collecting compiling and publishing statistics. That's its job. In a nutshell, it always has been. And the Act, uh, as it's currently written, uh, makes that has to happen. So you start collecting names, then say to yourself, how am I going to compile statistics about name? Do we want to know how many Bill McLennans we've got in Australia? Hopefully no more than one, I could hear people say. Um, but. Obviously, under the collecting name in the census, we are not doing anything in, in this last census to collate statistics. 
and therefore we're not publishing them. Now the Act says the ABS shall collate and the ABS shall publish. So it falls down. So you can't really say that the, uh, there's any power to compel people to do it. So that's, a, that's a layman's answer for you. I just think the argument is so straightforward that's... Yes, can I just go, go to that issue in terms of the collection of names? You're saying that actually providing uh, your name on the census form is unnecessary for the work of the Australian statistician. I oh, know they're collecting a name on the form. It's always been done on a voluntary basis, and then as soon as the census is taken, there's been uh, you know, in, you know, within a six months or so. Uh, don't hold me to the six months, but it's happened quickly. The, that information was destroyed. It does help to look to, to see if you've got names to work out the relationships within a household to make sure that they've been filled in correctly in terms of editing the returns. That's yeah. one simple example. But you're saying that uh, the legal basis for requiring uh, names and for them to be kept, in other words, making it compulsory, uh, is, could be counterproductive to the uh, cooperation that the Australian people give <laughs> to the census. Well, it certainly doesn't help them, does it? Um, I, I thought long and hard about whether I'd put my name on the census form, but I did in the end. I was I was rather exposed on this. Yes, OK. But you're saying that this census will use names and addresses to create a statistical linkage key for a unique identifier. Do you have particular privacy concerns in respect of that? Oh, well, uh, I didn't say anything about privacy in, the, in my introduction because there's so much in the reports of people who know more about privacy than I do that, you know, I've got to, they are bound with <laughs> with comments. It certainly does affect the privacy side, no doubt about that. Um, you. But, you know, our experience in my days, and I've been involved, uh, I started working on the censuses in 1960, after the end of my first year at university. I spent uh, four months in Sydney doing nothing else but uh, hand coding all the census returns for that year including, you know, you know, whether it be uh, labour force, whether it be whatever. And uh, you, you soon learn that uh, people are very helpful, but they, they don't like uh, to have the, the government push over them too much. So if the provision of the name was something that was voluntary, you think that would be more likely to get a greater cooperation of Austra those Australians who have a wariness about providing their name in the first place? Well, let me put it this way, and I, my contention, and I answered a question a moment ago, is that the, uh, for all the census that I know of, uh, in the recent past anyway, that the names have not been collected compulsory, they've been collected voluntarily, and the census have worked well. That's the answer to your question. So do you think, you've talked about trust and goodwill, do you think that the quality uh, do you link the issue of trust and goodwill towards the, the, the ABS um, to the quality of the data that is likely to be collected? Yes, I do. Um, no one likes to be told you've got to do something. Or well, maybe it's just me, but no, most, most Australians are not no. like that. They don't like saying, you know, if you don't do this, we're going to throw you in jail or fine you $180 a day or whatever. That gets people's backs up. And, uh, you know, when you're dealing with the Australian population, you've got, to, you've got to get them on side. You've got to get them to cooperate. And whether they like it, whether, whether they do it in a vindictive manner or not, they are more likely not to be, not to give you the information you're looking for. In the, see, I, I was heavily involved in Labor Force surveys, and there was one classic case we were in a, we were in a pilot test and one interviewer from Tasmania, by the way, I might add, um, wrote into us and said, I went to all these houses and they, uh, they all told me the answer to the question was no, but I can, I can assure you from their actions, their, their real answer was yes. So people, if you don't handle them right, you do get answers, you do get an impact on the information they're giving you. That's well known. So, so could it be that whilst the intention of the ABS was to uh, have a greater degree of uh, 
uh, you know, get a great degree of accuracy in the census by requiring the provision of names, uh, do you think that, paradoxically, an unintended consequence could be that there'll be less cooperation in respect to the census? Well, it could be. That has to be, be shown. Yes. I, look, I have one final question, and if there's time later, I'm happy to go back, but I know my colleagues may have questions. In terms of linking the data between the, the census, uh, Section 8 of the Act seems to suggest that the census is a distinct activity taken every five years. Do you think that it actually confers a power to link the data across each census? Uh, well, that's a good question. I don't, I don't, I'm not absolutely sure, sure of that. Depends on what you do with it, I think. Um, linking, linking is a, is a, is, is a, uh, is a, is a difficult process. It's also a significant process, is it not? It, Sorry? It, it's also significant in that the level of linkage here of data goes, uh, and the extent of it goes beyond what's been done in any previous census. Is that a fair comment? Well, you're mixing up two concepts. There, yeah. are, there, are two, there are two things going on. There's a census, the taking of the census, and that's got nothing to do with matching. Yes, I know that. Yeah. And after the census is over, you've got a matching process. Yes. Um, in, the, in the past, uh, they have done, a, in, on an on a, uh, experimental basis, done some matching to work out how it works. And uh, that's been well reported in a methodological study that's on the ABS website. I, I look for its... Uh, address this morning to give to the committee and I, I, for some reason or other, my old fingers can't get the internet to work properly today. But it did, what that report says is that, uh, as you'd expect, I think, uh, if you start this data matching and move it over time, as you get further and further away from the source material, just like with uh, longitudinal surveys, the, the results get worse. And uh, the Milton methodological study said that that business of uh, moving uh, censuses forward produces roughly the same accuracy as a longitudinal survey. And uh, in my view, that accuracy of longitudinal surveys is notoriously poor. OK, thank you. I don't have any further questions at this stage, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Senator Hume. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr McLennan, thank you very much for your submission. It is very, very um, detailed and well researched. And uh, it's particularly, I can see you've written it with an extraordinary amount of enthusiasm. There's an awful lot of inverted commas and bold and, and statements like elephant in the room and underhand and shifty and, and all sorts of um, quite colourful language. I'm well, interested that's, first that's and foremost. That's me, I'm afraid. Sorry. That's me, I'm afraid. I speak colourfully too, so I, you know, I understand that. I didn't. I, I might have missed this. When did you retire from the ABS? Oh, when was it? Uh, I've got a note here somewhere. It's so long ago, I forget. June, uh, June 2000. June 2000. Thank you. So 16 years ago. Can I ask you just a, a couple of things that you've said? today, you said that you have a friend that knows a lot more about the census than you do, there are people that know a lot more about privacy than you do, that the, 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 that, um, the Australian Government Solicitor General's Office uh, has said that the ABS can collect name information on a compulsory basis, but you doubt that that advice is credibility. Can I, I just ask you what the motivation was for you in putting together such a comprehensive review and presenting it to this committee? What was it that you know, made you do this? Well, the, the, the comprehensive review I've, that I've submitted is just a summary of a number of papers that I've been uh, uh, writing and uh, sharing with the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So I deliberately did not rewrite anything and just put the papers together and you could read, read a trail. So um, this is a bit of The a start of the whole process was that uh, when I saw what they're doing with the law legislation, and I've had a lot to do with uh, the ABS legislation, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I think I know as much about the Census Statistics Act as most lawyers do. Um, I thought the ABS was making a bad mistake, and I, 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 I did write to the statistician saying that, and uh, I got a reasonably terse response, which uh, rubbed me the wrong way. So I've uh, persisted with looking at it. 
And the other th reason why I'm writing these things, I get, I get rung up by people all the time. I've been rung twice this morning looking for comments on the Labor Force survey. It's so this is an ongoing crusade for you? No, 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 it's not an ongoing crusade. I'm known uh, in the uh, sort of the economic side and the uh, statistics side of, uh, in Australia that uh, if people want to ask me a question, I will talk to them and be prepared to try to explain difficult statistical things in simple terms. So people come to me. Thank you. That's my only question. I, I, like, I like talking about statistics, by the way. Mm. As you probably gathered. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Senator Stirl. I'm oh, sorry, Senator Griffith. Griff. Sorry. <laughs> Call me whatever you like. That's fine. Uh, Mr McLennan, you stated <coughs> in your, um, in your uh, document that neither the Australian Privacy Foundation nor any other non-government privacy agency were consulted during the 2016 Census Privacy Impact Statement. Now, is this unusual in your assessment? No, I, I thought it was um, extremely unusual. Um, but on the other side, there was no, there was no uh, legal obligation on the ABS to consult with uh, people like the Australian Privacy Foundation. But it, it just seemed to me to be a, um, a probably a, poly, a, you know, a process mistake <coughs> on the part of the ABS. You know, when, you, when you're going through something like this, trying to make a big change and you want to pe get people on side, you've got to talk to them all. And you can't talk to them all, so you talk to representative groups. That's what you do. And the Australian Privacy Foundation uh, has a lot of contacts with uh, a lot of people who know a lot about privacy and other things. So if you don't consult them, you not only get the Privacy Foundation offside, you get all other people offside. So therefore, I think it was a, probably a poor decision on the part of the ABS. I don't think it was done with any vindictiveness, although, you, could, you know, not vindictiveness. Uh, it wasn't done with any reason. They're not going to talk to Australian privacy people because uh, they're all privacy nuts or whatever. I think it was just probably a mistake. There was that uh, damning privacy impact report by privacy expert Nigel Waters Nigel, relating yeah. to, um, to changes in the 2006 census. You also mentioned that in 2011 privacy concerns were also raised. Yes. Uh, do you consider there are any um, factors different between 2006, 2011 and the 2016 census that would get a different outcome in that analysis? Uh, short answer, no. And uh, one of my papers I actually referred to that matter, and uh, did not, they may be not in front of you, and said, you know, uh, if I was uh, querying the ABS on this, I'd say, well, this is what happened in 2006, and this is what happened in 2011, was it? Um, what's changed to make it okay now? The short answer is not much. One thing that has changed, going back to the actual Act, is that the regulations changed prior to the, the current census where name is now included in the regulations. I think name was included in the reg could have been included in the regulation before. Okay. That just, that just, that all that says is that you can ask, you can ask for name. Right. Okay. Doesn't you. make it compulsory. Thank you, Senator Griff. Uh, Senator Xenophon, do you have any further questions? Uh, just a couple, Chair. Just, just going back to the chronology of this, and, and, and I ask this of you as a, as a former chief statistician. Uh, I, you know, I note that you retired a number, you know, 15 years ago, 16 years ago from the position. But in terms of keeping in touch with the public, and a lot's changed since 2000, the timeline of events suggests that there were problems earlier in the day, there were a number of uh, problems, but it wasn't until 11pm um, um, uh, and I think the problem started uh, with an outage at about 10.08am on the 9th of August, but it wasn't until 11pm that there was a, a public message uh, from the ABS. I don't think it was done before that um, uh, to advise that the form will be out of action for the rest of the night. Do you have any views as to how you think, as a former chief statistician, um, how the Bureau should communicate with the public to, to ensure 
uh, confidence in the process and in the census itself. Well, I, I, I wasn't involved at all in this exercise, but um, I have been involved very much in uh, public relations and uh, that sort of exercise for censuses. And uh, as you will know, the public relation exercise in, in respect to this census was, shall we say, uh, not up to par. Uh, anyone who saw the, uh, the skit that put on on television would, uh, as I did, I cringed when I saw it. Um, you really can't collect a big census properly and, unless you spend some money, a significant amount of money, on PR to get your message across. Now, as regards the processing itself, when it went belly up, uh, I think ideally the, the ABS probably should have reacted uh, a bit quicker, but uh, it's the first time that's, you know, collecting the information electronically. Uh, subject possibly to uh, people trying to, uh, you know, breach a system was ever undertaken. So maybe the Bureau acted out of uh, slow to react, probably. I think that's what the words are. It probably could have been cautious. They weren't, under, weren't fully sure what was going on. Now, I'm making all that up because I was not involved at all and I don't know the people who were involved, so I can't even comment from that angle. Thank you. And my final question is, 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 is a broad one relating to those people that completed their census form accurately, but they did not provide their name. Uh, do you think, do you have a view uh, as to whether that compromises the essential integrity of the information collected? And do you have a view whether those people uh, ought to be tracked down and prosecuted and whether that would be a fair thing to do? Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, I have to uh, fess up that I was a statistician. We did prosecute a few people. Um, but that was for not completing the forms at all? No, 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 no. Oh, no, it could, yes, that was not, not completing the forms at all. But we only did it in, uh, in extreme circumstances. I was going to say early on, and I, I didn't uh, get around to it, was that given that, that I think there is a significant doubt whether it is legal or not. I'm sure, in fact, I'm sure it's not legal to collect name compulsory, but I've been going to print that many, many times. Under those circumstances, I think it would be a gross injustice to, to have, have people prosecuted and fined. That's a personal opinion. But it, it doesn't, comp if you accurately complete the census, but don't put your name, you put everything else in there that's required of you, does that compromise the census? Uh, well, I, I don't think it does, but it, yes. you asked me the question whether they could prosecute, and I think under the law they could. Yes, but in terms sense. of the integrity of the census, not providing a name is itself well, uh, a problem. Well, whether the, in, the integrity be breached if the people filling out the census form were miffed about the uh, having to give name, so they didn't give the name and then they uh, botched a few questions deliberately. Mm. That could easily happen and nobody would know and that would affect quality. Mm. But I don't know that's happened. I don't, couldn't give an estimate if it did or did not. Yes. It's a bit uh, in the, it's in the, uh, even the post enumeration survey won't pick that up because they only check on coverage. You know, how many, are any houses missed or are houses counted twice? They don't go in to see, well, let's have a look at your questionnaire, you, what your answer in the census, and did you give us the right answers? You need a, a survey like that to really give uh, a senator to give you the, the correct answer to your question. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you, Mr McLennan, and thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Senefine. Senator Hume. Sorry, Mr McLennan, just one more question. Surely. Uh, people um, intentionally, erroneously filling out a census form is nothing to do with whether they had to put their name down on it or not, um, compulsorily. In previous years, uh, we've had however many people claiming to be <coughs> Jedi Knights. Now, I don't think that was done because they had to put their name down compulsorily. And it wasn't because they were miffed, in your words. No, I read, I read that the other day, that the, 
there are more Jedi Knights than uh, Jewish people in Australia, was it, or That's close to the same number? Exactly right. So, I, I, do you think that you know it's a rather long bow to draw to suggest that because people had to put their names down uh, and uh, compulsorily, that they potentially Ooh. would have um, filled out the forms erroneously intentionally? Well, I don't know. It's a long bow. Uh, you know, if I got put out. Uh, you didn't put yourself down as a Jedi Knight, though, surely? No, 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 I put myself down as Bill McClendon, hoping they'd misspell it or something, but uh, I didn't give him a date of birth. I gave uh, age last birthday, because that is nowhere near as intrusive. But that has been done in previous years and have nothing to, oh, nothing yeah, to, that's do, true. Nothing no. to do with whether you had to put your name down compulsorily. Oh, no, 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 but because it wasn't never been compulsory before, so you can't, I can't give you an example in the past where it was compulsory and what happened, because it never happened before. Right. Thank you, Mr. McLennan. Thank you, Senator Hume, uh, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. McLennan. I don't think there's any further questions, so thank you very much for um, thank you. appearing before us today. I now